All right, so I'm here with Attorney John Meyer, who has represented myself and Ian and James are the three that were here in court today. Um, some of the other defendants in this case have kind of, uh, the parking forces have acknowledged they're no longer really involved. Um, so John, as far as like where we stand today and uh, like what brought us here, um, what exactly was the Supreme Court decision um, in this case that allowed it to be refiled or well, the way the Supreme it was? The Supreme Court basically made two rulings. The first ruling was it upheld the decision of the trial court to dismiss the claims and damages against the six defendants on the ground that those claims were barred by the First Amendment. It, the second ruling was the, the trial judge had earlier held that since the damages claims were dismissed, there was nothing left upon which to base an injunction. The Supreme Court said that even in the absence of damage claims, the trial judge still had the authority to issue an injunction. It said, it, it said that the court was not going to rule whether an injunction was appropriate here, whether an injunction would be barred by the First Amendment, but it sent the case back to the judge saying you can't automatically dismiss the injunction issue because you dismissed the rest of the case. So we're now back before the Superior Court addressing the issue of whether an injunction should occur both as a matter of the court's equitable authority and as a matter of constitutional right. Okay. And uh, so the next, there may not be any more hearings in the case, but something that is upcoming is a deadline to submit legal, uh, legal memos? Correct. Okay. And uh, once those memos are submitted for the case, people will be able to read them from the court? Correct. Cool. Well, it's very... Or from, <laughs> from our office, if you want. They're, they're, they're publicly available at that time. Cool. Well, it's, I mean, it's been surprising for me, at least, that the case has gone on this long, that we continue to be brought out to hearings. It sounds like it may be uh, dying down in the sense that they didn't really raise any grievances for most of the people that were originally involved. Well, the, 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 it seems like the factual aspect of it's receded. All the parking officers and enforcement officers testified that they were as upset and well, they were seem to be as upset now as they were upset before. Um, the legal issues, I mean, the is ultimate issue here is not about um, you know, Robin Hooding or about parking enforcement officers. It's about to what extent um, does the court have the authority um, to basically limit the activities of demonstrators and how does it balance the rights of demonstrators with the needs of the demonstrates in a sense. And this type of issue has come up mainly in the context recently of abortion clinics. Um, but it's the same issue at a national level. I mean, that's what the court's addressing, and whatever decision it makes may well be appealed back to the Supreme Court, New Hampshire Supreme Court. So, you know, the, the legal issue is still very much um, open. Okay, and one of the issues that the judge asks for attorneys to address was whether or not there have been other cases in which floating buffer zones, as asked for by the uh, city, have been approved by a court outside of issuing restraining orders because people are threatening others. Uh, is there, what instances are you aware of of there being buffer zones authorized by a court well, that are mobile? Well, first thing to, to address that, use the word floating buffer zone. Floating buffer zone means a buffer zone, in this case, that what the city is asking for is a certain space around the parking enforcement officer. So as the parking enforcement officer moves, the buffer zone moves, and that's what's called a floating buffer zone. The only precedents I know of involving floating buffer zones have to do with abortion clinics. Um, but they're qualitatively different because they're floating buffer zones, i.e. that, in other words, that, that the protesters can't stay get within more than X number of feet of patients going into the clinics. So the patients but are the floating buffer? Right, but the difference is the, float, the buffer zone, the floating buffer zone only applies within a certain proximity of the abortion clinic. In other words, they're, they're, they're sort of both, there's a fixed zone which has to do with the distance around the clinic and then the floating buffer zone within that fixed zone. In this case, the city of Keene is going considerably beyond that and they're asking for a floating buffer zone that would apply to the whole of central Keene. So, at least from our point of view, it, it's qualitatively um, more extensive than anything that a court has granted before which is part of the reason for the involvement of the New Hampshire Civil Reason in this case. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you for the update as to where the case stands, John, and also thank you for stepping up and representing us in this case. Well, Garrett, thank you for being an activist and giving us the opportunity to uh, vindicate through your activity First Amendment rights.